The message title today is The Call of the 23rd Psalm. We love this scripture. It is a favorite. It is among the first scriptures Christians commit to memory. I memorized it in children's church at Christ Tabernacle Missionary Baptist Church. And one year as a child at the Thanksgiving table, um, I shared and my family had to wait until I finished the entire 23rd Psalm as my grace before Thanksgiving dinner. We read it at funerals, often named as the deceased favorite scripture or the only one the family really knows well. It is the core to our faith. Most of us recite it on demand. That's exactly why we should revisit it every once in a while for new insights, new revelation, new guidance for this life's journey. For while it is often read at funerals, it really is about living. One Old Testament scholar calls it an eloquent psalm of trust that celebrates God's gift of and provision for life, both in times of crisis and on a daily basis. And in these days when we seem to be in a time of crisis on a daily basis, I hear this Psalm differently. This morning I hear the 23rd Psalm calling us and compelling us in new ways of being in these trying times. The Psalms are songs. Some are considered poetry written by God's people, in some cases for the assembly of God's people, or written by God's people and adopted by all of God's people as their own song. And that's fine to have a favorite song. It's fine to read someone else's very personal words and reflections about God and to feel that those words resonate with you, but to have the greatest appreciation for the words. You need to come and we need to come to an understanding of the writer. So the first call of the 23rd Psalm to us this morning is, to, is a call to an appreciation for its author. The author is believed to be David. I'm sure that's in your Bible. If you open your Bible to the 23rd Psalm, you'll see a Psalm of David. David was first and foremost a shepherd, certainly qualified to write and compare God to the role he knows intimately, a shepherd. So, to, so the shepherd, David, says confidently, the Lord is my shepherd. But before we go much further, let's learn more about David. This is the same David from 1 Samuel Chapter 17, the David who was the youngest of eight of Jesse's son, Jesse from Bethlehem, whose three oldest brothers, David's brothers, were fighting in a war with Saul against the Philistines. Go back and read about David this week in 1 Samuel 17 to get the full appreciation of David the writer of Psalm 23, for this is the David who was not supposed to be in the war but ultimately gained victory in that war by defeating Goliath. When you gain an appreciation for David, you'll find that David had strong faith in God. And, and when he saw a threat against the people of God, that threat being Goliath, while all the soldiers in the Israelite army were afraid of Goliath, small young David inserted himself into the war saying, who is this uncircumcised Philistine anyway that he can get away with insulting the army of the living God? David loved God and God's people so that he knew he could defeat this enemy with God's help. As a matter of fact, David even encouraged the army saying, don't let anyone lose courage because of this Philistine. David told Saul, I 
your servant will go out and fight him. In 1 Samuel 17, 47, David famously says that he will fight and defeat Goliath, that, this, that all of this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And in these days when there is a threat in the land, we need to know David. We need to have an appreciation for David as the writer of the 23rd Psalm that we so love. And we need to not only know what he said in Psalm 23, we need to know what he said right before he defeated the threat named Goliath. See, it's like Dr. King, most of us, if not all of us know his speech or some line in his speech, I have a dream. But some of us have no clue what else Dr. King said that might help us in times of crisis, the very crisis that he himself fought. We need to read, as a friend reminded me this week, King's essay, where do we go from here? Chaos or community. It might just help us with this current chaos in our city. Well, the 23rd Psalm is calling us and compelling us to have an appreciation for David as the author. And David not only said, the Lord is my shepherd. David said with boldness, who is this uncircumcised Philistine anyway that he can get away with insulting the army of the living God? In other words, what is this enemy that has come up against us and has God's people afraid, stressed out, and discomforted? David said, I will go out and fight him. David said, the Lord does not save by sword and spear. The sentiment sounds like Paul in Ephesians 6, 12. Paul says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. David says, for the battle, Somebody know the song by Yolanda Adams, the battle is not yours, it's the Lord's. And he, David says, will give you, enemy, into our hands. We need to heed these words of David in every enemy that comes against us. The evil that pervades on every hand and use what God has given us, just as David did to defeat the spiritual wickedness that comes against us. I promise this sermon is about the 23rd Psalm, but if we're going to love the 23rd Psalm, if we're going to claim it as our own, our favorite, then we ought to try to appreciate the author, take heed of his faith, his courage, his, his belief that God could use him to defeat the enemy. And as we recite this psalm and love this psalm, we never separated from the battle. And David's very words in the midst of that battle, that, that the battle is the Lord's. The 23rd Psalm is calling us this morning, hear the words with fresh ears now, that we have an appreciation for the author. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. He restores my soul. The psalm calls us not only to an appreciation for the author, it calls us into an intimate relationship with the creator. David, by penning this psalm, gives us access to his relationship with God. It's an intimate relationship, as a relationship between a sheep and a shepherd. That God, like a shepherd, will do what is needed to restore the sheep along the journey. I'm sure David had times when he needed to be restored. Do you need to be restored today? With all that's going on, do you need that restoration? Do you need to be led by still waters? 
Well, David tells us that you that that when you have an intimate relationship with God, God will make you lie down in green pastures, lead you besides not rough waters, but still waters. That God will provide what you need and will restore your soul. Now, we can't get that from David's intimate relationship with God. The psalm calls us to our own intimate relationship with God. David, who has the courage to fight Goliath, who willingly goes into battle, has faith and surely has experience that God will restore his soul. The 23rd Psalm, which we love and know so well, calls us to first appreciate the author. It calls us to our own intimate relationship with the creator. But it also calls us to follow the shepherd. Verse three and four says, he leads me in right paths. Another version says, on paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The psalm calls us to follow the shepherd. And I've never connected verse three and four before, but the spirit is connecting them today that when he leads me on paths of righteousness, those paths might be through the darkest valley. See, sometimes when we follow the shepherd, we'll be led to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. With an appreciation for the author, we know that David walked the valley of the shadow of death. He went to take some food to his brothers and saw that the whole army was afraid of this giant and he walked into that valley of fear and said, fear not, we can defeat this enemy. So we are called to follow the shepherd and following the shepherd might lead us into the valley of the shadow of death. So let's test this. Our shepherd as Christians is Jesus. In the gospel of John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus in fact says, I am the good shepherd. And so the question is, does the good shepherd ever call us to dark valleys? I'm glad you asked. Go with me to another gospel, the gospel of Luke. Chapter 10, after being asked by a man, a lawyer, how do I inherit eternal life? Sounds like he's asking about paths of righteousness. Jesus and the man have a conversation about the love commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And then the man asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, the darkest valley, some scholars say, fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away leaving him half dead. That's the valley of the shadow of death. Now by chance, Jesus says, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw the man lying in the valley of the shadow of death, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. Jesus is answering the question, how do I inherit eternal life? What are the paths of righteousness? Jesus says, but the Samaritan came near him and saw him and was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, gave him health care, poured oil and wine on them, and then he put him on his own animal, brought him to the inn and took care of him, gave him housing. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Then Jesus says to the man who wanted to know, how do I inherit eternal life? Jesus says, go and do likewise. What am I suggesting? That the 23rd Psalm calls us to follow the shepherd 
on paths of righteousness. And that those paths of righteousness might sometimes be the valley of the shadow of death. What am I suggesting? That the 23rd Psalm calls us to follow the shepherd and Jesus is the good shepherd. And sometimes Jesus calls us to dark places where people have fallen into the hands of robbers and have been stripped of all that they have and left for dead. And that, my friends, is happening today. And it happened yesterday. And it happened yesteryear. And it's all connected. And Jesus has been waiting for someone to follow him into the valley of the shadow of death with an understanding that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Jesus has been waiting for someone to follow him into the darkest valley. Knowing that the battle is not ours, it's the Lord's. With the courage of David to say that the Lord will give you, enemy, into our hands. So instead of just loving the 23rd Psalm, we need to hear the call, the plural calls of the 23rd Psalm. First, to appreciate the author, David, who defeated Goliath, not with armor and armory, but with what he had in his possession already. To fight the enemy and knowing that the enemy was not flesh and blood, we need to hear the call of the 23rd Psalm that calls us to an intimate relationship with the creator, that one that will restore us in the midst of the valley. The call of the 23rd Psalm calling us to follow the shepherd, even to follow the good shepherd into the darkest valley. As we love our neighbor, our injured, broken, battered, who was left behind to die neighbor, we are called to care for those who have broken as we would care for ourselves. David actually begins to pray in verse four. He says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me, God. He switches who he's talking to and he begins to talk to God and say, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I know you're guiding me. I feel your guidance, the divine hand of God. Before, me, before my enemies, you set a table in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with all my cup overflows. I have all I need. I'm restored. God, you take good care of me as I seek to go to the darkest valley. In this intimate relationship with God, David reminds God what he's already done for David once before. He believes that God will do it again. Keep comforting me, God. Then he ends with a testimony. And he says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He's confident of this thing that surely goodness and loving kindness. Mercy is one of those words in the Hebrew that is not very well translated. There's not an equivalent word in English. So scholars struggle with what to say and they came up with the word mercy and loving kindness is another way to put that word. Hesed is the word in, in, in Hebrew. That God has such love and kindness for us and will give us that as we follow the good shepherd, goodness and loving kindness will follow me. Not some days, but all the days of my life and I shall dwell. No doubt, I shall dwell. No plans to leave the church, I shall dwell. No plans for me to abandon my faith because things have gotten hard, I shall dwell. God's been too good to me, I shall dwell. Where would I go anyway, I shall dwell. God is my help in times of trouble, I shall dwell. The Lord is my keeper, I shall dwell. The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God bless you and keep you, amen. Mm -hmm.